I am Councilwoman and Mayor Pro Tem Tamika Isaac Devine, and it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you guys to the 12th Annual Mayor's Walk Against Domestic Violence. Before we get started uh, with some remarks, I'm going to ask if we could bring forward Chief Aubrey Jenkins, uh, Deacon Aubrey Jenkins, to bring forward the opening prayer, um, and then we'll get started. Let's all pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for this occasion, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for just blessing us to be here. We pray, Lord, that all things that are said and done and through this walk, Lord, that we bring in more awareness to domestic violence, Lord. We pray, Lord, for those victims that have been, uh, be, have been affected by us, not only the victims, Lord, but the families as well. So we ask you, Lord, to please bless, heal, touch, and deliver, Lord, and just give us the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Chief Jenkins. And also, I just want to recognize, because I know Chief Jenkins has another um, engagement, I want us to all thank him. The Columbia, Columbia Richland Fire Department has donated the water uh, for our walkers today. So we want to thank you so much. Y'all help me thank you. All right, now, so I am excited about today. Um, every year, this is just um, an amazing, amazing event. Um, some years we have rain like last year, some years it's cold. Today we've got beautiful, bright, sunny skies. We have good temperature, good weather, but most importantly, we have amazing people here. Um, it is my duty to preside over this program, but also to bring you some remarks about uh, the facts and the purpose of the walk. And I share with a couple people, um, most people who've seen me speak, I usually kind of speak off the cuff. I've actually written down some notes today because I've really, um, I've, I've been praying about what I was going to say today to you guys because um, I just think about us coming out here every year and where we are in South Carolina when it co comes to domestic violence. Um, just for those of you who don't know my history, a lot of times when I do the interviews, people ask, you know, are you a survivor? Have you been, ever been a victim of domestic violence? And I'll say, you know, by the grace of God, I have not. But that doesn't mean make the issue less important for me. It is very important for me, particularly as someone, uh, my first job out of law school, well, actually, I'll go back. Prior to law school, when I was in law school, I met um, an amazing woman sitting behind me, uh, Nancy Barton, who was looking for volunteers to go into the prisons to work with women who were uh, victims of domestic violence who had killed their abusers. And that was my first introduction to domestic violence. Right out of law school, I became a violence against women prosecutor, um, and then I was a violence against women um, legal services attorney, and then I went on to the state attorney general's office and was a prosecutor. And so that's kind of where I, where my history in domestic violence is. And um, we come out here and we walk and we raise awareness and it's always a great day. And I always give you the stats and, and, and where we are in South Carolina um, and then encourage you to go out and do something. Um, but quite honestly, I feel like um, that's not enough. You know, I, I, I always kind of tippy-toe, I give the facts, but those of you who are out here, you know the facts, you know the stats. Those of you who are out here have been affected personally, you've got family members or sisters or girlfriends who have been affected personally, you have seen it, so you know the facts. So I don't need to preach to you and share with you statistics because you have lived the facts. Um, but what I did want to do today before I bring my, my uh, speakers up here for remarks was just, um, you know, when you think about really the last two years in this country, um, most ex importantly, or especially the last two weeks, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I just get frustrated. I wake up and I, I read the paper or watch the news and I hear remarks about people, um, and I'm not saying whatever's on their heart, but you know, well-meaning, well-intentioned or not, the, what they say and what they do do not so support for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. And it has been frustrating because I feel like, you know, we tell people, you know, we tell everybody, you know, our voices can be heard. This walk and other things like that are ways that our voices can be heard. And they are. So don't get me wrong. Don't say, okay, I'm not coming to the 13th Annual One because Tamika said our voices are not heard through the walk. I want you out here. But I want us to, to also realize that this is just a symbol 
of the bigger thing that we can do and that we need to be doing in our communities. Um, but there are a lot of more important things uh, or oh, not more important. There are a lot other things that we can be doing to complement our presence here at the walk. Um, and so I just wanted to share with you guys um, that thought and, and challenge the folks here as you listen to our speakers who are going to come forward, as you hear uh, the story of our survivor, um, as you walk with your team that you came out here and you're walking through the beautiful, you know, greenway and, and thinking about what are your next steps. Today, you're physically taking steps, but what are your next steps after today? Um, and I really just challenge us that we have to, we have to be ever more vigilant. You know, the Violence Policy Center came out. This year, we're sixth in the nation. Um, you know, we've been as high as one several years. We've been as low as nine, um, but we're always in the top ten. Um, and that just shows me we got to do something different, guys. There's something that has to be different. And I'm not trying to be political and talk, you know, Republican, Democrat, man, woman, although I will say we need more women in elected office. But, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, I'm saying we've got to have people who not only understand the issues that are plaguing our community, but we have to have people who are willing to make a difference. Um, and so... I am, I am going to be political in that I'm going to tell you today is one month, one month away from election day. And we have people all up and down the ballot from uh, congressional uh, candidates to um, our state offices to our local offices like solicitor and county council. And, you know, we have to have people all up and down the ballot that understand our issues and not only understand them, but also understand and recognize when they don't know an issue and they don't recognize an issue that they talk to people who make who have the information and so I just wrote down three things you know I'm, I'm, I go to a Baptist church I'm a big about you know three points so people can remember so I just wrote down three things one is vote and I don't mean just you know we always hear people say vote 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 I wore my my pen today about voting just to remind you guys about voting but today starting on Monday you can early vote or not, we don't have early voting in our state, which is another issue that the people that we elect can, can change. But the people that we currently have in office don't allow us to early vote, but we can vote um, at, in person absentee starting on Monday. Um, and so I want to challenge us to vote and get other people to vote. We got to make sure that we're educated about who we're voting for and who we're putting in office and that our voices are heard. That when they make decisions, um, and I told you guys about my history and, and working my first two jobs, for my first two jobs were funded by the Violence Against Women Act that went into effect. It was written by then Senator Joe Biden, went into effect in 1993. Um, it... Um, effectively expired last week. However, the president has um, extended it into the end of uh, December or to the beginning of December. And so those folks up there in Washington um, have the ability to reauthorize the Balance Against Women Act or not. Uh, the first, when it passed the first time, when it was reauthorized, uh, the second time it was bipartisan support to reauthorize it. The last time it was reauthorized, um, there were a lot of, of people who didn't, a lot of elected people who didn't support it because they didn't support some of the people who were being protected under the Violence Against Women Act. So to me, that means for you guys, it's important who, is, who we send to Congress because it's important that we have people who authorize the money that come to our state to fund prosecutors, to, vote, to fund victim advocates, to vote um, law enforcement, to help combat domestic violence in our community. So we gotta vote and we gotta make sure our friends vote. Secondly, we need to hold our elected officials accountable. Whether you voted for them or not, whether you voted for me or not, you should be able to call me anytime and say, Tamika, I want to know what is the city doing about domestic violence? What is the city doing about this issue? You should be able to call your solicitor, your congressman, your um, county council person, your governor's office. You should be able to call them anytime and say, what are you doing? And I want to hold you accountable. I want to know how are you making this issue important in our state. We got to hold people accountable. And for people to say voices don't matter, you know, we look at, you know, whether, you know, you're happy or not happy about the way the vote went yesterday um, in Congress and, and will likely go today. A week ago, two women stood and talked to their congressperson and said, 
I am a survivor. I am a survivor of sexual assault, and I want you to hear my story, and I want you to take a pause. And he did take a pause. Now, we can argue whether or not that made a difference. I'm not going to get into that debate, but it did. Those two women, their voices were heard. What would it do if all of us called our Congress people? If we were calling them, and we were calling um, Senator Graham and Senator Scott and Joe Wilson and saying, um, this is my story, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to do something about it. And then when they don't do what we think they should do, then we need to hold them accountable, which means we need to be rallying people and voting them out of office. So uh, that is our second thing. We need to hold all elected officials accountable. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat, if they represent South Carolina, if they represent Richland County, Kershaw County, whatever, they represent all of us. And they need to be held accountable to us. And then my third thing is we need to continue to be an advocate. You know, I listened to the debate yesterday. I was disappointed by some of the remarks I've heard in the last week. I have called my Congress people and, and, and expressed my disappointment. But instead of being disappointed and mad and frustrated, I am using that energy to be more of an advocate, and I, that's what all of us need to do. That's number three. We need to be advocate. It doesn't need to be just the first Saturday of October that we come out here, we put on our purple, we feel good, and we walk. But we need to be calling people. We need to be when a, you know, an abuser is let out on a PR bond, we need to be there holding people accountable. When money is cut from domestic violence shelters, we need to be out there being an advocate, holding people accountable. We need to continue to be an advocate 365 days of the year, not just today. And so I'm going to get off my preaching. <laughs> uh, but that was on my heart, and I just I had to say it. I just had to say it because I don't want to feel like we come out here, we feel good, we walk, but then what? We don't do anything else. So my challenge to you guys as you listen to our fabulous speakers today is to take those three things and go out there and you continue to take steps against domestic violence and do what you can do because we all can do something. Some of us are elected and appointed and policymakers and we do things there. Some of us are um, you know, advocates and we, we work in that field. Some of us are PTO moms and church leaders, and we can do our work there, but we all can do something. So with that said, I am going to shut up, and I'm going to go back and put on my Mistress of Ceremonies hat, and I am going to introduce you another fabulous, amazing advocate, uh, Sara Barber, who is the Executive Director of the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. I know that there are some of you in here that I've talked to about how do I get be an advocate? How can I do this? How can I do that? Well, SAR is a person, her organization is the umbrella organization for our state. Uh, they have been working uh, hard in the trenches for many, many years, and she can help and point you to the resources necessary to uh, elevate your advocacy in this issue. And so if you all would please help me and join me in welcome SAR Barber. Thank you, Tamika. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo what um, Tamika said in that Senator Scott and Graham expect my call. They expect to hear from me every day. But if they expect all your calls too, we may actually start to get some change and they may listen to all of us in a way that maybe sometimes they don't listen to just me. Um, unlike Tamika, I don't speak off the cuff. So I have um, some prepared remarks about what October and what these kind of events mean to me. So every October, we gather to remember the dead, those who have been killed by abusive partners during the previous year. And every October, we recoil from statistics that show our state to be one of the most dangerous in which a woman can live. Every October, we pause to recognize that homicides are only the horrific tip of the iceberg of domestic violence in our state. But as terrible as statistics are, sometimes they can obscure the lives they represent the lives impacted and lost to the many types of abuse that form the pattern of domestic violence that sears through our families and communities. Individual stories get lost in numbers. So today, rather than talk about statistics, I want to focus on two stories that have impacted me. So the work I do as an advocate that I hope I carry is rooted in the legacy of Marva. 
I met Marva when I was first starting to work with a program that intervened with offenders. Her husband had attempted to kill himself and then assaulted her in the emergency room in front of several doctors. After being arrested and spending some time in jail, he was referred to our program. Then a few weeks later, he assaulted Marva again, and I started talking to her pretty much every day, talking to her about her possible options, about safety planning, trying to engage her in services with sister care. After a couple of weeks, her husband moved back in the house. The call stopped, and I think, I, ju I just can't imagine how terrible those few days were for her. The next time I saw Marva's name was in the newspaper a short while later. Her husband had thrown gasoline over her and lit her on fire while her son watched. She died a few weeks later. Fifteen years on, and I still think about her every single day. And although it may seem strange to say that the hope I carry is inspired by her, it is because her story carries forward the urgency of the work we do, the work we need to do as a community, and so nobody else has to endure what she and her family did. My hope is also found in the story of Scott, a man who abused his family for years, reducing his wife, in his own words, to rubble, and who was then mad at her because she was in that state, because of what he had done. Scott made a decision to acknowledge his responsibility for the abuse and to make the changes in his behavior and beliefs that would enable his family to be a place of safety rather than fear. His wife and adult sons attest to the positive impact of the changes he chose to make, how it transformed their lives, and in their voices we hear the value of this work. So there's two stories with two very different endings, and to me in that difference lies the essence of hope. People can choose to change, Communities can choose to focus on prevention, to teach everybody about healthy relationships and the unacceptability of violence as a tool to control the ones we say we love. We can choose to stop this before it begins. So this October, we can choose to use this Domestic Violence Awareness Month to say that the city of Columbia is ready for change. It's really hard work, it's gonna be long work, and it's gonna make people uncomfortable and it's gonna make some people angry. But it is possible. So I ask you most of all to make sure that South Carolina's past and all communities past on the issue of domestic violence is not our future because we can do so much better. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, and thank you for sharing, sharing those stories. Um, our next speaker really needs no introduction. If anybody is remotely um, aware of domestic violence uh, issue and the work that's being done in our community, then you know Nancy Barton. Nancy Barton is a, the executive director of Sister Care, who is our local shelter. Um, and Sister Care and, and Nancy have been working in the trenches forever. <laughs> I told you guys Nancy was um, the first person that I worked with when I was working. Um, she got together volunteers to go in the prisons and, and work with women who um, had killed their abusers. And so instead of their abusers being penalized and, and, and gone, uh, prosecuted for the abuse to their wives, their wives were actually in prison because they had finally fought out in the only way they knew, and it ended in the death of their abuser. And so Nancy has seen everything. There's probably nothing in this world that can shock Nancy as it relates to domestic violence. Um, and to work in this field so long um, and continue the fight that she does is just awesome. It is amazing. And I'm always in awe of her strength and um, just happy to be around her. So if you guys would please help me and join me in welcoming Nancy Barton. Thank you so much, Tamika. You're, you're right about not much shocks me anymore, but I tell you, it still breaks my heart. It breaks my heart every day. So I'm glad that so many of you are here today giving up your early Saturday to show your numbers and presence. I want to introduce our survivor speaker, Yakisha Means, who is a long-term and very special volunteer of Sister Care, and we work with survivors of domestic violence and their children in the Midlands. Yakish uh, has developed and founded her own business, A Better You. She's a licensed professional counselor. She's a public speaker and personal coach motivational in her words and her experience, professional experience in part has been in the juvenile correctional system as well as working with service people and their families. 
I know Yakisha because of her big heart and what she does to help tell her story in an effort to try to make a difference and hopefully change some thinking and understanding on the issue of domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and harassment. So if you would please join me in welcoming Yakisha. I first became a victim of domestic violence when I was lying in bed, probably at the age of three or four with my older sister at one end of our trailer. And our parents' bedroom was at the other end of our trailer. And when I first noticed that this was my world was when I was awakened by the screams of my mother. Sean, Sean, come and help me. Paul, why are you doing this? Stop. And my sister would urge me, Sean, go help mama. I'm only three or four. She's eight and a half years older than me. But see, my, my father and I, we shared this, this funny, you know, relationship. He called me his lady. He doted, me, he doted upon me. And so here I am, this little girl with long pigtails in her pajamas. It could be 3 a.m., 2 a.m., or 5 a.m. And I get up out of bed hearing the bumps up against the wooden panel walls in their bathroom, continuing to hear her screams to stop. And I will walk down this hallway, this dark, long hallway, and I would slowly enter the entering of their bedroom. And he would stop what he was doing and he would look at me. And then he would come and sit down on the edge of the bed with his bloodshot red eyes. And he would say, they messing with me, lady. I never knew who they was because there wasn't nobody else in the room. I don't know if he was in a drunken state, a drug-induced state, if he was hearing voices, I don't know. But all I know at that age was the only thing that I could do to help my mama was to show up in that room. And I would pat him on the back and he would say, everything is going to be all right, lady. And sometimes when he was sitting there on the edge of the bed, my father, he would have his 32 gun in his hand. And there was always three guns in the house. His 38 would be on the, um, the, the, the counter. He would have his 32 in a holster, and he would have a shotgun in a closet. And that is where my mother had to lay her head every night. Can you imagine being held hostage, knowing that there are three guns that can take you out in any moment? That's the world of domestic violence, the fear, the anxiety, not knowing as my sister and I laid in bed every night that he abused our mother, if this was going to be the night that he actually ended up killing her, if this was going to be the night after he had sexually assaulted her, after the physical abuse, when he fell asleep, and when my mother would come and shake us, y'all wake up, wake up, we're going to your grandmother's in, in town. If he was going to catch us and not only kill my, our mother, but also kill us too. And most times, where did my sister and I have to go? After being up all night hearing that, we went to school. Sometimes it was on the weekends, and my mother would get up and cook breakfast. She would have a knot on her head. She would have a black eye or a bruise right here on the side of her mouth. And guess what? Like most families, we pretended that the night before had never happened. The denial, the secrets, that is the world that most of us at this place today, we grew up in. Also, my father, he ended up going to prison. And you would think life is about to get better for us. By this time, my sister had moved on into the Air Force. She got out of there. My mother and I was left, but I was missing something. At the age of 15, I was missing that closeness that I had with my dad, all that chaos that I was accustomed to. The love, I thought, you know, a man had to, to physically abuse me, so I got involved with a 20-something-year-old man at the age of 15. 
who treated me like my dad treated my mother because that to me as a child learned behavior that is what love looks like that is what love feels like and one night I ended up shooting and killing this man and I went to Department of Juvenile Justice so my father and I were writing each other we're gonna take on the world once we got out and so I went from being a victim to being an aggressor but while I was there, I started my journey to becoming a survivor, to dealing with everything that I had been impacted by as a child. And so my father got out before me, and then I got out into an independent living program in West Columbia. One of the teachers, Nellie Hartso, helped me get into Columbia College. Things are looking up. My, my father remarried to his mistress that he had had children with while he was married to my mother. But yet, he still was calling her. He was still stalking her in our little town of Union. A lot of people didn't know that. That's something that we found out later on. So here, here we are, you know, I'm getting ready to go to, to Asbury Hall in, in August. And my dad called me one Saturday. He said, lady, I'm thinking about capping your mama. And I said, daddy, don't talk like that. And he said, like he had always said years ago, everything is going to be all right. That Sunday, my mother came down to go to church with me. We went out to Quincy's, had a good time. You know, back then, Quincy's had all those cookies, you know, and those rolls. So we got, you know, our napkins and put up some in our purse. <laughs> we had a great time, right? And so I told her what my daddy said. And she said, I'm not running no more. If it's time for me to go. It's time for me to go. And she, we hugged and we kissed and she got in her car and she went back home. And I went to my 4 to 12 shift at Babcock Center. You ever have that feeling that you're not physically sick, but it's something in your spirit that's not right. For eight hours, I wasn't physically sick, but I felt like something wasn't right. And all my coworkers, they kept asking me, Keisha, what, I mean, you need to go home. What's wrong with you? And I said, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like I got to throw up or anything. I just, I don't know, just something off. Well, when I got off, I got to my godmother's house. And I was on the phone with a friend of mine. He was like, you don't sound like yourself. And it was back then that you had them rotary phones and used to get beats. Well, I got a beat. And it was my Aunt Tutu from Saluda, one of my daddy's older sisters. And I'm not very close to her. So immediately when I heard her voice, I'm like, Oh my God, I got to get home to Wallace Thompson Hospital because I know my dad didn't beat up my mama real bad and she's probably plugged up to all these machines and beat up really bad. And then she says, Sean, you have a car, right? And I said, yes. And I'm preparing to, you know, jump in my car and head home. And then she finished her sentence. Well, you need to get home. Your daddy then killed your mom and killed himself. And I'm thinking, God, why now? After all these years, he didn't remarry. He didn't remarry this woman that he had kids with. I'm about to start college so that I can do better with myself to get her out of union. She was even thinking about moving down here, and she was going to get a job at Babcock. She's getting her GED. Why now, God? Why now? That phone call ripped my heart to pieces. It dropped me to my knees, and all I could do was scream. Why now? Why, God? Why? That phone call is a phone call that many of you in this audience have received. That phone call is a phone call that many of you have had to make in this audience today. Some of you may have had a knock at your door, like the mother of this recent 17-year-old girl the police came to her door to inform her what had happened to her daughter. And I came here today with my aunt and my cousin that we don't want any more of those phone calls to have to be made. No more of those phone calls need to be made. And I stand here today to be transparent on how serious it is for us to move from survivors to becoming more advocates, advocates to be a voice 
for those who no longer have a voice. What does that look like? That looks like your churches, your schools, your sororities, your fraternities. That looks like calling in people to educate young teens about healthy and toxic relationships for them to be able to differentiate. What does that look like? What does that sound like? When your boyfriend say he don't know what he would do without you, well, let's go further with that. What do you mean you don't know what you do? I would hope you would move on to the next female or the next male. I would hope that means that we go our separate ways without you calling me a hundred times a day, without you popping up at my job, at my school. Let them know what the red flags are. If he wants, he or she wants you to quit all your sports, don't want you to have anything to do with your family or friends, that's the red flag. That's not cute. That's not love. He wants you all to himself so he can have control and power over you. But also, we have to show them in our own relationships because they're watching us. They're learning from us. How do we operate in our romantic relationships? Are we cursing? Are we fighting? What are we doing in front of these kids? What does being an advocate mean? It means moving from being a survivor, having had something done, and managing and overcoming to being active in it, doing something about it, calling the needed people, forming, I don't know what, I mean, relationships with people in other states to where we can have somebody transfer over to another state to achieve a new identity, if need be, depending upon the severity of the danger. Because leaving your abuser or a batter is the most dangerous place. It's the most dangerous time. My mother, you would think she would have been saved. My daddy didn't remarry. However, he still thought what? My mother belonged to him. And if he couldn't have her, he was going to make sure that nobody else could. So I stand here today. No more phone calls. It's each one of our responsibility, as Ms. Devine said, to move forward and do something and become more active and to, bring, and to preventing us from being another top 10 of women killed by their abusers in the state of South Carolina for next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakisha. Um, so next I am going to introduce two ladies to you and I will let them come uh, first, Stacy, then uh, Tashima. But um, at the City of Columbia, we take this issue very seriously. As you can tell, we, you know, we've done this walk. We have advocates and our law enforcement officers. They get training um, above and beyond what's required by the law, so that they can uh, address these issues. No, we're not perfect. Um, yes, there's always work that needs to be done, um, but we are dedicated to this issue. And so I want to introduce to you guys Sergeant Stacy Walker from the Columbia Police Department. And then after Stacy, I will have Tashima Martin, who is a victim advocate with the Columbia Police Department, come forward. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm still trying to get the tears from my eyes after hearing all of that, and I really don't know what to say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for expressing that the way that you did. Again, um, I'm Sergeant Stacy Walker, City of Columbia Police Department. I have been actually a former DV investigator, so I do know firsthand and witnessed some of the things that she has spoke of. To say the least, that it is very challenging for young ladies to actually speak up, and I commend you for that. I know it is very difficult, and, but we need to stop that. We need to end that, and we all have a part to play in that. Not just law enforcement, as she said, everyone is an advocate. So let's diligently do our part to combat this what is epidemic that's truly affecting every community, every walk of life. Anyone can be a victim. It doesn't matter where you work, where you live, who you are. You too can be a victim. 
Now, we all have a part to play. All I can speak on today is of that of law enforcement. With law enforcement, I think a key thing for us is awareness. We are aware of what you guys are going through. We are always training and doing what we can do to bring you the best service that we can. When we come to the scenes or, or incident, we try to accurate, accurately put all the information and stuff in the reports that we can, but we are only as good as the information that we are given. So when we come, when we're there, be open, be honest. If you feel like you can't talk to us, and I'm not gonna go step on her toes too much, we have phenomenal act victim advocates in place for you to talk to. Phenomenal. They have plenty of resources and stuff. I'm sure Mr. Shiva Martin is gonna expand on that. Again, I don't wanna step on her toes. But again, I just wanna thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm gonna be walking with you guys, and if you wanted to stop and talk, we will, I'll be more happy to do so. Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Tashima Martin. I'm a victim advocate with the City of Columbia Police Department. I'm going to briefly explain to you what a victim advocate is and what we do. Um, a victim advocate is a professional trained to support victims of crime. Advocates offer information, emotional support, and help finding resources and assisting victims throughout the judicial process. Um, I have I started my journey as a victim advocate with Sister Care. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to become a victim advocate because like our survivor, I am a child of domestic violence. I grew up um, listening to my parents fight and breaking up fights and calling the police and it wasn't as many resources back then for my mother as it is today. So part of the, my therapy, my healing was to try to help the women in this community be able to combat vic domestic violence in the men of this community because domestic violence is not um, just for just about women uh, men are also victims of domestic violence um, when I started this journey I didn't know how it was going to impact me it was definitely um, a form of therapy and counseling for me because it gave me an opportunity to help um, victims of domestic violence be able to move past these situations and every time I helped a woman of domestic violence or a man of domestic violence I thought about my mother and it, it empowered me um, I grew up to be a victim of domestic violence, um, partially because of what I was exposed to and what I've experienced. And I was fortunate enough to be able to recognize and to get out of that situation before it got too bad. Um, but if I could give advice to anyone dealing with domestic violence or who grew up in a household with domestic violence, the same way we're out here to walk and we, we, we do things to take care of our bodies, we eat well, we exercise, we have to take care of our minds as well. And one of the things that greatly helped me was counseling and doing this work, giving back, volunteering, and trying to make a difference. Um, as an advocate, we offer a number of different services from um, assisting victims with filing for order of protections, assist going to court with them, uh, transitional housing, helping them to get in safe houses, um, we work with a number of different of community partners to assist us in being able to help victims. Um, we also, we, we do court accompaniment. Um, we do a number of different things. So like Sergeant Walker said, if you don't feel comfortable speaking to the officer or you, or you have additional questions and you just want to have an idea of what your rights are as a victim, because you do have rights, there is a victim bill of rights you can ask to speak to your uh, victim advocate. Victim advocates start from bond court all the way up th throughout the entire judicial process. Um, again, I appreciate you all being out here for showing support for domestic violence. It's something that's very personal to me and I wanna see everyone to continue to give back and um, assist us in assisting you all to get out of these type of situations. Thank you. All right, so as we are about to get ready to, um, to close and um, have Reverend, Reverend slash Commissioner Aaron Bishop come forward uh, to pray for our walk and pray for all victims and survivors out there, I do want to just a couple closing remarks. Um, I would like to, so I'm reminding you guys my three points, we're going to vote. Remember, what, you can start Monday. 
uh, to vote in person absentee, but also encourage other people to vote. There are so many people who feel like my vote doesn't matter, my voice doesn't matter, and we need to show them that it does. So make sure that you come out and vote. Um, we're a month away from um, our general elections. Um, with that said, um, I do, um, and this walk has always been nonpartisan. We've always had different folks. Um, today, um, we do have, I know, two candidates with us. Um, I see Sean Kerrigan. Sean, raise your hand. Sean Kerrigan is a, a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives. So thank you, Sean, for being here. And I think you've been with us in the past. And I mentioned to you guys about the Violence Against Women Act which was, you know, started being supported nonpartisan back in 1993. Unfortunately, over the years, it has gotten very partisan, um, and now um, it is due to be reauthorized. And so if it's not reauthorized by the beginning of December, then millions of dollars that have come to this state to help fund sister care and prosecutors and victim advocates may, may no longer be available. So we need people in Washington who understand the importance of, of supporting um, survivors. So I thank you, Sean, for being here. Um, we also have um, with us um, actually a, a very um, good friend of mine who has always been a, an advocate. He's been out with us before, but I think this is the very first time you've been out here as a candidate. We've got um, Byron Gibson, who is a candidate for solicitor for Richland and Kershaw County. Get, Byron, raise your hand. Byron and I, in law school, worked together, um, and he's always been an advocate uh, for victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And our solicitor will um, make the choices of prosecuting these cases, whether or not to have a no-drop policy and other things. So thank you, Byron, uh, for being here. Our, there, and then I saw Judge Milton Kimson. Uh, he's on the phone. Judge Kimson is out here. He's always been out here, so we thank you for being out here as well. Um, I also want to thank our volunteers. We've got so many volunteers who help us. The domest, um, Domestic Violence Walk is a walk that, although the logistics are supported by the uh, City of Columbia, we couldn't put it on without volunteers. So I want to thank all of our volunteers for out here. Uh, we also have some students from W.G. Sanders. You guys raise your hands for me. So thank you, guys. Um, and so I, I just want to brag on them a little bit because I'm a mama of a Double G Sanders student, but brag on them because they are always uh, working in the community, but these young people also recognize, although they are not eligible to vote yet, they are eligible, um, they are able to make their voices heard, and so they are at domestic violence walks and the peace walk and other things, making sure their voices are heard, so that in inspires me and encourages me, and I thank you guys for being here. I thank the public relations, media, and marketing staff for the City of Columbia. Most of them are working, but you guys raise your hand, yay, over here. Um, they help us get the word out. They help us get the volunteers. Um, I also already mentioned the fire department who's donated the water, the police department who are, um, are providing our escorts um, during the walk. I see they're scattered through here, and I think some of them are already out there. But y'all, when you see um, our CPD officers, please thank them for what they do today and every day. Um, and our Parks and Recreation staff, I know Ms. Wanda Austin is here and others, um, the Parks and Rec staff help us uh, tremendously. Um, so now we will have uh, Reverend Aaron Bishop, who is a commissioner for Richland School District 1, and I'll also kind of brag on that role that he plays as well, because, you know, we think about um, the effects of domestic violence within our community, and it's, it's seen... Um, in a huge, a huge way when our young people go to school. And so it is important that everyone from our commissioners and our superintendent down to every teacher and, and um, social worker within the school district be aware of how this affects students and how they can support young people who come to school that are witnessing violence within the homes. And so we always thank Aaron for being here um, with us um, in that capacity and as the pastor of 
Grace Christian Church. So I'm going to ask Reverend Bishop to come up and uh, give our benediction and pray for our walkers and our victims and survivors. And then after uh, Reverend Bishop speaks, um, Jessica Jeter, who is the uh, fitness coordinator at the Catherine Belfield Booker Washington Heights Center uh, for the City of Columbia and an amazing, amazing uh, personal trainer and fitness instructor will do our warm up. We don't want people to get, although you're like, oh yeah, it's just a walk. You can, you can, if you're not warmed up properly, you can hurt yourself. So we want to make sure we're warmed up properly, and then we will kick off our walk over here. So Reverend Bishop, please. Good morning. I want to first just take the moment in liberty to uh, thank the City of Columbia, Mayor Benjamin, and City Council, and especially City Council and Woman Tamika Isaac for taking this courageous stance to do this public awareness. Can we celebrate their leadership real quick with a hand clap for appreciation? <laughs> and to that powerful testimony of becoming a survivor. There's a quote that says, when two elephants fight, the grass withers. So as we get ready to pray, we pray that our grass grows again, that we grow in joy, happiness, and peace. Let us pray. Good morning, Lord, who, who looks low but sits high. Thank you, Lord, that you have come to govern our hearts and minds because you have bound, binded up the brokenhearted and healed our wounds. Lord, today as we walk, we walk with the authority to find peace that passeth all understanding, to remain with joy that has been given through the testimonies of people who have overcome domestic violence. Now, Lord, as we go forth, Send your angels to give charge over our life, Lord, that though the devil has an agenda to rob, kill, and destroy, your son Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So we walk in the abundance of our life today to walk away from the pain and agony because although we may have seen defeat, we didn't suffer defeat. Thank you, Lord, that today this walk will give us the ability to heal wounds and go forth and become courageous advocates of what is a victory that's already been given to us. Now, Lord, as the battle continues on, vengeance is yours, but the victory is ours. So thank you, Lord, that the healing of our infirmities, our challenges, will take place today going forth. That as we walk, Lord, there will be no injuries physically because we're being healed spiritually. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> 